Yes, lads, what's going on? Welcome to season two, episode 33, 32, 33 of the Little Running Irish Run podcast. In this episode of the podcast, we are joined by Paul Byrne. Paul is the third fastest ever 400 meter hurdles, sorry, um, in Ireland's history of the 400 meter hurdles. Uh, so, yeah, that's a pretty Pretty big achievement. He's also head of athletics in DCU um, College over here in Dublin. And um, me and Paul talk about pretty much um, like his entire running career. We get very deep into his running career. We talk about DCU and um, you know what his job's like down there as head of athletics. And um, but we get very very deep into his running career. Obviously, you know we start from the start as usual. We talk about how he got into it, why he got into it, and it's very for Paul. It was very community based, so we we find out like uh, a lot more about that and how his community was very uh, heavily involved with his with his choice in starting up running. And then we get a bit later into his career when he started, you know, representing Ireland, <clears throat> running fast times, and and the rocky road he had to get to to becoming um All Ireland champion over the four hundred meter hurdles. It's a really really great episode. I appreciate Paul coming on the podcast. Uh, and then, as I said, we talk about um, it, what, what his job is like down in DCU being head of athletics. And um, so, as I said, uh, once again, I appreciate Paul coming on. It's a really, really great episode. And you guys are really going to enjoy it because it's very, as I said, very, very running and athletics based. And Paul's one of the first, if not the first, like, sprinting um, and definitely hurling athletes that we've had on the podcast. Pretty much all of our athletes have been long-distance cross-country athletes. Um, so it was great to have Paul on to get a little bit of a different perspective in the, the running world, you know. Not only sprinting, which the 400-meter distance is, but also the hurdles involved in, in that as well. So, yeah, that's always good to see, to have that little bit of a bit of diversity. Um, it's a really, really great episode. Um, as I said, we get very in depth into Paul's running and it is an amazing career, you know, representing Ireland in European games, university games, on Europeans under twenty trees, becoming an all Ireland champion, uh running a, a very, very fast time that you'll find out in this episode and become the third fastest ever over the four hundred meter hurdles in Irish history. Um so yeah, you guys are really gonna enjoy this, so let's just get straight into it. All right, everybody. So I'm here with Paul Byrne. Thanks, Paul, for coming on to the podcast. No hats at all, Kareen. Thanks for having me. Pleasure. Yeah. No bother. And um, I'm really excited about this episode. So before we get into it, do you want to just give a little bit of a background about yourself? So uh, yeah, I'm I'm uh, uh, Paul is my name, Paul Byrne. Uh, I'm a 400 meter hurdler. I'm from County Leash originally, but been living in all parts of Ireland for the last uh, few years. So I was based in Limerick for for a good few years. Back up in Dublin now because um, I'm working in DCU, so I'm head of athletics in DCU. Um, but uh, yeah, from Leash originally, and my club, my home club, is Saint Adams AC. So um, grew up in a small, rural little little uh, countryside, not even not even a town or a village. Nothing, nothing close by. Carlow would have been my closest town. So grew up in in the sticks out in the country in Leash, and was very lucky to grow up in a place where. Um, it was a very strong club and a really strong club in the community, and um, that's how I kind of got into athletics. And it's it's been part of my life for the last thirty years, twenty five years since I've been running since about five or six. So um, I'm very lucky to be have, have competed at a, a reasonably high level, and also work work um, in athletics and and trying trying to develop athletics in Ireland as as best I can. Yeah, no, that's um. That's some CV anyway, and uh, real quick, real quick before we jump into, I remember hearing in the More Than a Runner podcast you were talking about if you're just driving down a country road and you look to your left, you'd see you'd see your club there, and you were saying that for the location it's in, you had some pretty good facilities. So do you want to just give us a little bit of a of a breakdown of what the club's like? Yeah, the club is it's it's old, it's old, it's an old enough club. Nineteen fifty five, I think it was founded, so it, it started and and pretty quickly, like the 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 visionaries of the club at the time, I suppose they built a a cinder track and yes. it's a cinder track there. So like your your own club, Morton up in Santry, uh, or Clonliffe up in Santry, they that would have been a cinder track, and all tracks really were like that back in the day. So there, there was a cinder track um, built pretty quickly. Um, so that's still there. It's four hundred meters, so it's actually really nice to train on when it's not when it's not too cold because yeah. it freezes over. But the same as same as Tartan track. So yeah, growing up a mile from there, we used to either cycle or run down to the track, and then 
uh, we do our sessions or do our run and jump and throw on down there. And, uh, there's like there's like a mile and a 1500 loop across the cross country kind of I suppose greater or, uh, loop out there for the distance guys. And then there's there's an indoor um, place there now too. So we have like a place to go inside when it's when it's really cold. And there's a, a full gym upstairs. So for a place that's kind of out very much in the countryside and not near anything at all. Yeah. You'd be, You'd be very surprised to see it out there, but it's a it's a really good club, and I was very lucky to to grow up in the place that I grew up because there's not many other places like it in the country for sure. Yeah, definitely. And you said there, you know, you had all the facilities for throwing, long distance sprint, yeah. or whatever. And uh, as I know right now, you you kind of dabble your foot in in everything when it comes to athletics in general you obviously done the the sprint and a bit of cross country we also done some high jump and um a, a long jump and also did you, was the club very like you kind of put your foot in everything and seeing what you were good at or was it just part of of the club and just for enjoyment purposes yeah no like the obviously having the facilities that the coaches were very it was great because we always tried a little bit of everything at training. Yes. Well, I suppose there is obviously little little athletics and maybe you would have done some of that when you were younger as well. And You do a little bit of run and jump and throw. And, but that really wasn't, I suppose, much of a, a set thing when we were younger. Yeah. But we did it anyway. We did a little bit of... Everyone did our warm-up together, our two laps, the, the standard warm-up. Yeah. And then we'd break off into little groups. Maybe some people would do hurdle drills. Some people would go off and do... The shot put for 20 minutes or half an hour and then um we'd come back and we'd do maybe a couple of mini games or relays or something together and then we'd finish off with a few sprints or we'd, we'd go over to the long jump or high jump and yeah i think when you have all those facilities at your disposal um it makes a big difference like i, I used to work for athletics ireland as a development officer as well before i started in dcu so i used to go around the country to different clubs quite rural clubs and clubs starting off small as well and of course, everyone's dream is to build a track, and um, that's ultimately what you would like to to do. I suppose little bits of equipment and stuff like that really helps along the way because um, doing the high jump, doing the long jump is a little bit more fun than running around the mucky field, in, in my opinion, anyway. So uh, you have those sort of things when you're a kid, you're probably going to stay in the sport maybe a little bit longer, and all that stuff points towards that now. If you if you if you have multiple sports or if you stick at multiple sports on multiple events as long as you can till you're 14, 15, 16, even into your late teens, you probably have a better chance of really developing longer term in the sport. So, yeah, that's how I started off. We did a little bit of everything, and the coaches and the club always encouraged that. So, still, it's still the club mantra or motto. Definitely, and now as you said, like if you're going up and just, especially at a young age, and you're just doing laps and laps and laps. Uh, and as I said, especially at young age, you can be quite boring and you wouldn't probably enjoy as much as stick around. So having that is is always good. But you mentioned there that you joined when you were about five or six. Is it kind of, you know, you were saying you, you grew up in, in a small community. Was it kind of a thing that everyone done was joined the joined the, the, the running team or were you just, you know, interested in it? Um, well, I'm the youngest of four. So my both my brothers and my sister used to go and I used to tag along then. So... That was how really I got into it. Both my brothers were really good and my sister as well. Um, so I used to look up to them and um, it was just part of what we did every every Tuesday and Friday. We used to go to the club and then we'd have a race or a cross-country race and we used to just train twice a week and that was really it. And some of the older groups then would train maybe a little bit more than that. They'd do a Sunday or they'd do a mostly Sunday, yeah. Um, but it was really my, my brothers and sisters that encouraged me and my parents and family and stuff and being so close to the the club, I think, they used to just get us out the door because um, clear the house out. But yeah. uh, no, that that was it really. But like the club is really part of the community, similar to I suppose like Clonliffe, um, your own club, and like some of the clubs that are really big clubs in Dublin. Like it's it's really part of the community, and you see the, the stripe, the black and black and amber vest or tops, or you see the Rohini club tops around this side of Dublin where I'm living. And um, even when you're going down the street, sometimes you see people running with the tops on and. That's that's what you want. That's that's the kind of club environment that you want to be in because I suppose a lot of GA teams have that as well, and they take a lot of pride in where they're from and the club that they run for. And definitely where we grew up, that's definitely instilled into us. Like everyone from St. Albans, I think, takes real pride in running for St. Albans because we're embedded in the community and um, like all the volunteers, all the coaches, and everything as well are really really um, embedded into that. 
Yeah, yeah, I understand. That's that's always a good thing to have, you know, good community spirit, you know, open the club if, uh, or or even in a race if you know perform well, everyone kind of knows about it and it makes you yeah. feel that bit like that bit more better about it. So that's always good. And um, coming, you know, late a bit later from from just you know doing all the little different events in the club. When was it that you decided that right you wanted to do? Obviously, because we you know you have a quite successful four hundred meter hurdles career. So when was it that you decided you wanted to focus and, and train full time on it? Um, so like, I think I said it to Liam. Like you said, you listened to the podcast that I was on with Liam and more than a runner. Like I was never, never really good as a youngster. Like I don't think I won a medal at Leinster or All Ireland. I was in my late teens, really. Like maybe a few Leinster medals along the way. I did a bit of cross country and it was really just like I said as well to him it was it was a byproduct of showing up to training all the time yeah. that I to get better so if you would ask me when I was your age that I would have stayed running till I was in my late 20s and into my 30s now and be reasonably have a reasonably good co- career and compete senior international I would have probably laughed at you because yeah. I would have never have viewed myself as an athlete when I was your age like I really I, I look at you and you obviously love athletics and you know a lot about athletics but when I was your age I didn't know anything really about yeah. athletics and I just used to do it because it was part of where I lived and it was only just down the road so I used to do that but I enjoyed it so much and I stayed at it and then as a as a, as a I suppose a byproduct of that I started to win a couple of medals along the way and high jump was my real event I suppose initially when I was 17 16, 17, 18 into leading cert and I, I I had probably most success at that. And then I was doing a little bit of the sprint hurdles. Um, I think I medaled at all Ireland, all Ireland schools at sprint hurdles maybe first. And then I, had a, I was doing multi-events as well. So I kind of did the pentathlon indoors. And I, I think there was like a heptathlon for, for guys maybe outdoor, outdoors. Again, in the schools, Leinster schools, all Ireland schools, um, when I was in secondary school. But in primary school, I suppose... I think Cheryl touched on it as well when we were chatting to her. We used to do a little bit of everything then. But yeah, yeah, like high jump, sprint hurdles, triple jump, long jump, pole vaults. I think I have all our medals from, from all of those events. Um, so I, I, I definitely didn't do 400 hurdles. I think I did a, a 300 meter hurdles when I was maybe 17 or something. Yeah. In 17. I never, never really did it. But my brother had had some good success at 400 meter hurdles and he was a 400 meter hurdler so he kind of was like oh look why don't kind of want you to give that a go I was like Jesus like how am I going to give this a go like I've yeah. never ran, in, in training I never ran more than like 200 meters for reps yeah. we just did like some 150s or 200s sometimes so that really wasn't part of my training so it was when I was in fifth year in school fifth, yeah just the fifth year so my first year senior I I was getting quite good at the high jump, so I jumped around 190 and um, had a good day at the office because I, I won the high jump at the All Ireland Schools. Yeah. And then about 25 minutes later, I came second in the 400 meter hurdles. And that was one of my first 400 meter hurdles races. Yeah. So I was like, oh, maybe this isn't this isn't uh, so bad. No, it was ridiculously hard. It's a very hard event, but um, I kind of enjoyed it and the new challenge of it. Um, but I suppose then going on to college I went to college in DCU and again really didn't know what I was doing didn't know whether I wanted to be a high jumper long jumper triple jumper multi-eventer um, but I, I, I found a good group up in Dublin um, and I really got got stuck in there and I quickly started to improve then in the 400 meter hurdles because I suppose I'd probably reached my peak in the high jump I wasn't going to be the 6 foot 5 or 6 foot 6 guy that yeah. and uh I kind of knew that that wasn't going to happen for me. So I was like, look, let's put put all my eggs into this basket and see how it works. So um, I was I was training up here. And then within about two years, I'd made European under-23s, got the standard and made semi-final at that. So that was only really then kind of in second year in college when I really thought I was going to. So it's probably quite different to a lot of people's stories, like even like say Cheryl, who we were talking about again from the club. And, you know, she went to America and she probably got scouted to go to a scholarship, but I was nowhere near that level and I wouldn't have ever considered myself good enough to, to get a scholarship anywhere. And I didn't in, in DC with the start, but by the end of the time I was there, I did. So um, I suppose there's a, a little bit of a lesson in that. Like, if you don't, if you feel like, oh, I'm not good enough, I'm not going to get a scholarship, like, 
good things can happen if you put your head down and train hard and, and kind of work and find the event that works for you as well. Yeah, no, 100%. And like you, you were saying there that when you've done your first race, you were like, yeah, I could be good at this. But it's like over the summer, I was actually doing uh, some steeplechase training because I was yeah. going to run it. And um, so we were just taking the hurdles out and doing some 400s with the hurdles. And mm. it takes it out of your legs oh. so much more than just running on the flat. And um, I remember I was doing it with one of my teammates and this was his first session. And he went like, he was running it as if it was just a normal session. And then by the end of it, he couldn't do the last three. And I was telling him that it takes it out of you so much more. And uh, especially with 400 meters, it's like, it's basically an all out sprint from the start. Unlike the steeplechase, it's like a little bit more tactical. But I'd say coming into the final straight of a 400 meter hurdle, it's a lactic does be made. Oh, it's, 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 a, it's a cruel, a cruel event. But yeah. I think I ran a couple of 800s and I think that's on par. And I ran a couple of 400s as well. Um, and I, I always say that I think it's easier actually to run a four. I found it always easier to run a 400 hurdles. I think you have something to take your mind off the pain a little bit in the yeah. 400 hurdles. Like every 35 meters, there's a, there's a hurdle and you have to think about which leg I'm taking it on. And, where am I in the race? And you can kind of see where the people are around you. So there's other things to kind of concentrate on, but um, the 400 and the 800 are, are equally as hard, I think. So if not harder, definitely the 800. But um, yeah, over time, I suppose it, it got a little bit easier, but there's definitely been bad days and good days where you're like, Jesus, what am, what am I doing here? But yeah. uh, it's uh, it, it, it gets easier the more you train for the course, like anything else. So like the steeple, yeah, like that's, you look at it in the Diamond League and some guys have really bad technique and some guys have really good technique over yeah. the hurdle. Maybe not as important, but they're still, if you hit one of those barriers, you're going to know about it. Oh, yeah, 100%. <laughs> no, but you you were saying there as well, when, when you finished second in your first 400 meter hurdle race, you were like, boy, I can actually, you know, might be able to make something out of this. And, and you definitely did run a 50.03, uh, becoming the third fastest Irish runner in, in history. So do you want to just kind of talk us through that day, you know, how you were feeling before the race? Was it, was it on your mind that maybe you could, you know, get a fast time or was it just like any other day? So that season I had, it was 2016, I had went to South Africa on a training camp for, I suppose, trying to, in the back of my mind, trying to run sub-50 and potentially sneak a spot into, like, some major championships that year. So that that year was really good and I made European seniors, but I had a few niggly injuries that that I had a pretty bad day at the office at the European seniors. Like, I should have yeah. eaten out of my heat and I didn't. So it, it took me a couple of years to look back on that race <laughs> because it was a bad day and I went, went out a little bit too hard and then burnt up died of death up the home straight so uh, I learned a lot from that from that year yeah. I, I knew that I could run fast because I kind of ran a decent enough couple of times in 2016 so I knew if I could stay kind of healthy and injury free that it was a good couple of times in me so I opened up the season quite strongly I think I'd ran a PB almost pretty much straight away in Belgium um, around 50.6 and then one of my first races after a training camp as well and then um, coming into the race, I was trying to qualify. The, the main aim for me that year was to try and qualify for World University Games, which were on Tai Taiwan. Yeah. And it was going to be a really good trip if I if I got to go on World University Games. Now is like a really, it's, 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 it's I think it's second or third behind the Olympics, like Commonwealth Games, Olympics, and World University Games are the three biggest multi-sport games in the world. So I knew like that was something I really wanted to qualify. And I was I was doing a masters in Limerick at the time, so I lived, running up to that race, it was actually the last day I had to try and qualify. Yeah. So I got fifty point five, and the standard was fifty point three, and I was I was nervous, but we were, the hotel was straight across the road from the track, so it was the Diamond League track in Brussels, where I actually yeah. ran the league. Um, so I think Mo Farah broke the hour record there recently. Enough yeah, he that. didn't need it. So there's there's been some very good times running that track. So I knew, and having been there previously, I knew it was a fast track. Um, so I got into the the A race of the 400 hurdles. So I think Jeffrey Gibson was in it. So he had won the world championships or bronze, sorry, bronze in the world championships. I think two years before that in 2015. So I was in a really really good race, and I was nervous. Probably didn't have such good guys in a race um, with me until that time. 
and I got lane eight, or I think, or lane nine. I think it was a line, nine lane track. No, it was lane eight. And uh, yeah, like went through my usual warm up. It was a nice day, a really sunny day. And that's exactly what you want in the hurdles, of yeah. course, in any event. But the wind really affects the four and the hurdles a lot because you're looking to get the right amount of steps and strides in between the hurdles. So I kind of didn't really feel much better or worse than I normally would feel on any day. And I just was like, look, this is the last chance to try and get it. Uh, if I if I don't get it, I don't get it. If I do, brilliant. And I just went out very hard and got to 200 and didn't really see anyone coming up on my shoulder. And I was like, geez, okay, we're going pretty well here. So that after hurdle five, which is around 200 meters, I usually switch switch um, my strides. So I went from 14 strides to 15 strides. Yeah. So then coming around the bend from 200 to 300, still didn't really see anyone coming up on my shoulder and I was like Jesus okay we're actually going pretty well here and I passed out the guy outside me and coming into hurdle 8 then which is at 300 meters I was still feeling so strong like really really strong and okay I could see the guys coming up inside me but these guys are medalists at world championships yeah. so knew I was on for something fast and then I um, came into hurdle 9 took that really well and then just I was starting to tire a little bit so coming into the last hurdle I normally would try and not to switch legs again yep I took the last hurdle on my not not so strong leg so my right leg and um got to the line anyway and the time didn't come up straight away obviously it came up for the winner but the time came up just a minute or so after yeah I seen that and it was huge pb like a half second pb and 50 you know, three. I actually couldn't believe it and then about a minute later it's like jeez oh, how did I not break 50? Like, I would have I would have loved to break 50. Yeah. Uh, to run 49 for 400 hurdles is kind of like you're getting into good territory there. So I was thinking that straight away, but then obviously I was just delighted and I qualified for World, World University Games. No, that was... Um, you, yeah. you, were, you were saying there that, like, that season you run a 50.5 and then you, you also said that you were amazed that you didn't break 50. So are, are them slim margins actually big margins within the 400 metre hurdles? Yeah, because I suppose like in a 400, it's a little bit different that you, most guys would go, okay, I'm going to go out hard for the first 200 or I'm going to, I'm going to run 20, go through in 21 flat or 21, 22 flat for the first 200 and then just try and hold on or whatever. Like that's usually the tactics for a 400. Um, but like to, in the 400 hurdles, you can see exactly where you're losing time. So you can, you can clock even on a slow motion video or a video in yeah. training. You can see, okay, Jesus, from from two hundred to three hundred, I'm losing loads of time here. I'm getting really tired. Why is that? Was it really windy? Okay, and then you can see like that. So it's a little bit different to a, to a four hundred, but it is slim margins. Like if I didn't take that last hurdle on my bad leg or less preferred leg, I might might have ran forty nine nine or forty nine eight or something. Yeah. I can't look at it that way. I think I think I need. I always will look at it that I I always achieved way more. And have achieved way more than I thought I ever could. So to to run fifty zero three, if you asked me that when I was eighteen, nineteen, twenty, twenty one, twenty two, whatever age, I don't, I think I would have taken your hand off for that. Time. <laughs> so I'd, be, yeah. I'd, I'd be very happy with that. And anything I've achieved in the sport has been has been great. No, no, definitely. And uh, still, from what I know from the four hundred meters and the four hundred meter hurdles, that is. Uh, and it shows for the events that allowed you to qualify. It's a, it's a very, very fast time. And obviously then that led you to the Euros under 23. But before that, was that your first ever Irish vest? Or or, or did you ever run for Ireland before? I, I ran for Ireland once before that. So I never made a schools international. I I was doing multi-events, but I can't remember. I don't know if I made a schools international. I made the Celtic Games, which were on in Waterford at the time. Yeah. And so that was 2000. And five or six so it's a good level. but I qualified for the 100 meter hurdles yeah and my first time and I was going there was it was, it was Ireland uh, Ireland England Scotland Wales I think it was the fourth and the Celtic Games that time so got a good start I think I can barely remember at this stage but I definitely remember what happened uh, halfway down the track I hit hard and I fell and oh. I didn't finish the race so that was my very first international I remember being distraught afterwards I, yeah. my parents and everything had come down because it wasn't in Waterford it wasn't too far away my coach and everything at the time so it was uh, 
it was it was it was disheartening it was it was uh, you don't want that to be your first international uh, true yeah at any race of course you don't want to fall in any race but the fact that it was in my first irish fest it was um oh, i was raging like i was raging Definitely. but i think looking back on it now it probably made me a little bit hungrier to always get back in the green vest luckily i did a few times after that yeah, uh, luckily uh, it is right, and as you said, you know, for for it being your first Irish performance or, or your first Irish vest, uh, even as you said in any race, but especially the the significance of this race, you you wanted it to go perfectly, and yeah. um, not not to be unable to finish the race. And I know, especially in the short distance like the four hundred, and especially the four hundred meter hurdles, where you have to keep a good stride and uh, and keep consistent and good form. It would be impossible to even nearly start running again, never mind actually catching up with the pack. So, yeah, I suppose you didn't really have any other option than to, to not really run. Um, no. And it's not like it's not in the fight there, think you're really at the highest level if you, if you fall off the pace. That's, that's it. But with the sprint, any sprint or any kind of distance, I suppose, from 400 down, like if you do make a, one one mistake, you're kind of your race is over. Like, yeah, true. I suppose you could say that for a five k or ten k or even like the steeple, like you said, you were trying out for. Like it's, it's a it's it's a cruel sport that way. That things you're out there on your own and you're against the clock. Really, of course, you're against the other six or seven or eight people that are in the race or whoever many. But it's it's largely against the clock and it's you versus the clock. And um, in the sprints, I don't know how the hundred or sixty meter guys get it right. Like that's that's obviously another ball game altogether. Like yeah. they, if they make a wrong move at the start or get one foot wrong at all, like they're the race is pretty much over so um yeah it's it's fine margins but i think sport is like that anyway and Definitely. the sport that we're in is, is 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 hundreds and thousands of a second sometimes so it's uh it's i wouldn't i wouldn't have it any other different though and i think like that first international fall and stuff i haven't really thought about it too much until just right now really and yeah uh, so sorry about that no no yeah, <laughs> yeah thanks, thanks kidding um <laughs> it's uh it makes you look back and go like, yeah that probably did have an effect on me, I suppose, to try and want to get back in the green vest and yeah. to to right the wrongs of maybe that. And look, it was only a Celtic international that wasn't it wasn't going to change the world or anything like that. Oh, but true. I suppose at the time, it was it was a big thing for me and you know, my family and brothers and sisters and stuff as well. Yeah, no, no, definitely. But then, hopefully, moving into more of a positive note, you know, after running that fifty point zero three, obviously. Then we're able to qualify for the Euros under twenty three. So how did that end up going for you? Hopefully you didn't take another fall and now I'm just bringing well, no, that was, more that was world, world universities I qualify with that. Oh, thing. world universities. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that was that was it was a strange one because twenty seventeen the world championships were on early. So I didn't I hadn't uh, the time for world championships and Olympics in the four and hurdles it's just gone crazy. It's like it was like forty, forty nine two or forty nine three and I think it was 49 3 that year for the world championships. So I kind of knew, look, I'm not going to qualify for world championships. World, world University Games was on late in the summer. It was actually after the world championships. Yeah. Um, and we, we, it was, I think there was seven or eight Irish athletes went. So like Phil Healy, Marcus Lawler, uh, Michelle Finn. Um, there was there was a good, really good crew of us out there. Um, small, but like great, great environment. All the swimmers are love, like, up and coming Irish swimmers that are now qualifying for the Olympics were there. There was soccer teams, Irish soccer teams. Um, no, it was deadly. Really, really cool experience. Um, and I made it. I, it was it was roast and hot. It was like crazy hot, similar yeah. to, to Africa when I was there that time, like well into the thirties, but really humid. So like as soon as you stepped outside, it would be like drowned in sweat. Yeah. Um, so I didn't know how the distance guys. Keen Keen McManaman, who was a twenty k race walker, he had to go out and do that. Yeah, and that. yeah true. So we I, we were there for a few days beforehand and we acclimatized, but we probably could have done with a few more days maybe to, to get used to it properly. Um, and uh, it went it went well. It went well. I'd, I'd probably achieved as, as much as I could by making the semi-final. So I got out of my heat, came second, I think, or third in my heat. And so got a got a qualifying spot into the semi-final. Would, it, would have had to really get very close to my PB to make the final. And I suppose because of the season went on so long, it was into September. I, I think maybe some of my best times were already left behind me. Yeah, like true. I, I, I'd come second at nationals, around 50.2 at nationals up in Santry. Uh, that was a really nice day as well, just just uh, behind Tom Tom Barr. Yeah. So, um, 
I'd, I'd, I'd ran some of my fastest times already and then by the time I got to the championships I was probably a little bit tired I'd probably done a little bit too much training to try and sharpen back up a little bit and if I'd ran close to my PB I, I would have made the final but um, I, I, I think I came sixth in my semi-final or something like that so it wasn't what I really hoped but I did I did pretty well so I was happy enough for that yeah no 100% and yeah, even you know it was coming to the end of the season maybe didn't train the best but obviously being from Ireland that weather sounds like it, it sounds like torture to be running in and uh, no, oh. I, I know myself when I go out to Spain and I go out for yeah. a few runs it does be it does be horrible so um, no look maybe maybe then you know maybe that day it just was meant to be and things weren't in your favour but you know we're going to be I'm going to be kind of repeating myself here now for a bit so I just want to also talk about the the Euros under 23s and then go on to the the Euro senior so basically yeah just repeat myself there so what were the Euros under 23 like did that go a bit better or yeah that was my first I suppose real big proper championships like the Celtics was it's, it's kind of small like there's only three or four countries against Ireland and yeah. Yeah, it's a nice international, but your under twenty threes was the next big step for me. So I didn't qualify for European juniors or anything like that. Didn't wasn't really good enough at that stage to to do it, and was only getting better at the four hundred hurdle. So around fifty one something, I think, to qualify, um, or fifty two low. Um, it was on in Ostrava in the Czech Republic. So got got a really good team out there, and actually uh, Brian Gregan won a silver medal at that. that oh, very time. good. So uh, that was twenty eleven. So that was that was a great buzz, and it was a really good team, really big team like Paul Robinson, uh, John Travers, um, uh, loads. There was loads at it, and a couple of guys made finals, um, and then Grigo obviously got got a silver medal. So yeah. there was a great buzz around the camp. But yeah, that was that was my first taste of, of proper international athletics, and it was it was probably my, one of my favorite championships to be honest, because um, I had no real expectation. I was just delighted to qualify, and then all of a sudden. Got onto the starting line of my heat and finished really strong. I remember coming off the last bend, feeling really, really strong. Came up the home straight and got an automatic qualifying spot. So it was top three, went straight through to the semi final, and I got one of those. So um, I was light with that, but I got lane one for my semi final. Oh, so right. yeah. one, of the slower, one of the slower qualifiers. And I knew, like, look, that was, I was absolutely buzzing just to, to yeah. get through. So and um, that was a new experience, you know, having to, to cool back down, recover properly, because I had to go again then the next day. Um, so I went back to the hotel and all that was all new, of course, as well. And we were able to get physio and we were able to recover properly and eat and try and sleep. But like maybe you were the same after after a race. It's very hard to sleep. Um, 100%, yeah. Um, so I'd be thinking about the next day's race and so I was slightly nervous and anxious and all the rest of it. But uh tried to get some sleep and then got up the next day and ran the semi-final and I think I came I think six or seven maybe again in my semi but uh, I was I was absolutely buzzing I, I, I was very happy actually with how consistent I was across the two days I think I ran 51 high in, in both the heat and the semi-final so yeah. I, two days back to back like that showed me that I was in good good shape and I, Definitely. later on that summer I think I could beat again at Nationals so um it was it was a great experience and a really good team and the fact that Grigo won a medal really gave everyone a good buzz and I was lucky to be on a couple of teams where people won medals like that along the way so it's uh, it's been it's been been cool because Kira McGeehan won won bronze when I went to European Seniors as well um, so it's 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 cool to be around kind of athletes looking at them now going they're qualified for the Olympics and having trained with people that yeah. We're at the Olympics and all that sort of stuff. Olympic finalists, even Tom Barr was for the Olympics when I was training with him down in Limerick. So that was that was really cool too, you know. No, definitely. And like I feel after you finish a race, uh, just because of nerves and everything, it feels like a weight kind of lifted off your shoulders. But then, was it like then knowing then you have to race the next day? Because I feel like it'd be kind of, especially getting an automatic qualified to the semi final, it'd be a mix of. Oh, buzzing and feeling a bit more relaxed, but then also at the same time you need to be preparing for the next day. So what is, what's kind of going through your head then? Yeah, like in that one, I suppose particularly, I was I was just so happy to to qualify initially, and then to to, to get through to the semi final was an absolute bonus. Like I w- I wouldn't have even expected that really. So I think I ended up finishing like 18th or 19th in Europe that year, um, for under 23s. So that was deadly, but um. 
yeah, you're, you're like any race. It's I find it hard to sit down after a race, especially if, if it's an even race or if it's a nighttime race. Um, you're kind of you're still on you're still on kind of adrenaline mode, and it's, it's yeah. hard to put your mind off. And yeah, when you have two days back to back, like even at nationals, a few times we have heats and finals. Like the heats would be on the Saturday, and the fin- the final would be on Sunday. So stuff like that, and having done nationals in the lead up to or probably a few times before that. Um, is a, is a good learning curve so like any time even when, in, in the next few years it's just, when you can run national seniors like doing stuff like that and throwing yourself in the deep end and, and trying to get two races two days in a row it's really good practice for for championship running because uh, timed races and time trials and like those diamond league paced races are completely completely different to championship races yeah. because more often than not, you know yourself in middle distance races as well. The times are way slower, yeah, because they aren't. They don't have pacemakers and they don't have the rabbits to to chase after. So, I think some people that maybe are the fastest sometimes don't win the medals at championships because they're just so used to getting these pace races or getting the best lanes and the best tracks and the best places all around the world. So, yeah, like championship racing and racing back to back suit some people, um, and it definitely suits um, some rather than others and like I've had I've had a few chances to run back to back races and I don't know if it suits me or not sometimes the second day you may be a little bit tired a little bit flat hard to recover didn't sleep well all that sort of stuff and you'd be nervous but um, I think anytime you can get the chance to do that is always a good good experience no 100% and uh, yeah, as you said it's you know to do it early on in your career is better than doing it later on in career yeah, in your yeah career. absolutely like uh, even I don't think when well, no schools is all on one day. There's nothing really when you're when you're younger that like unless you go to like the three A's over in England or like some some English championships are on like over a couple of days like at yeah. junior level. I didn't I didn't really go to any of those, but I know some some athletes like I, when we when we were young when I was younger used to go over to England and run those championships there their juvenile championships and get races back to back and stuff. Yeah. It's, it's good practice. Yeah, hundred percent. And you were talking about in the. Um in the Euro seniors, Kieran McGean came back with a bronze. But for you personally, how did that competition go for you? Uh, yeah, so I think I touched on it a little bit earlier. Yeah. It, was, it was a bit of a disaster, to be honest. And it, like I said, it, it took me a while to, to watch back that race because it was a bit of a shocker. Um, I'd, I had a good season and good build up to it. And I had qualified quite early on that season. I'd ran a couple of 50 point, 50 point mids. So I think that was the standard, and so I had that boxed off, and I think I had a time from from the year before as well. So I, I knew pretty early that I was going to get selected, but I went to South Africa early that year with a tra- on a training camp with Mark English and Tom Barr. Yeah, and I was in really good shape, but I remember I had like an Achilles problem that just started to creep into my mind at that time. So that was like January, February in 2016 and it was kind of in the background always kind of there and slowly, slowly it started to get worse and worse. Yeah. And Achilles injuries are sometimes a death sentence for athletes because Definitely. it's I've heard some really horror stories of people getting surgeries and it never comes back right and you know, if it's not managed right, it's it's just really a really bad one. So I was aware of that and trying my best to, to keep on top of it and I was able to train maybe some days pain free or relatively pain free, and then other days would be could barely walk out of bed in the morning. So, physio, lots of physio, lots of strength training, lots of all that sort of stuff. Was able to manage it a little bit, but I was kind of race again, similar to maybe a couple other seasons. I'd I'd left a couple of good races behind me, and when I got to Europeans, I was I was just I wasn't at the races at all. I'd I'd probably was just chasing to get back, chasing to get the training in because the injury had set me back a little bit. So I was like, look, I'm going to have to try and just run my absolute socks off here. So I went yeah. out for the first 200 very, very, very hard and was almost in the lead, I'd say, at 200. Um, and I was, in, I was in a decent enough heat. And then just with 150 to go, so coming past, like the water jump steeple chase, I just remembered it was like a slight wind coming across and it was a windy enough step the, the stadium in Amsterdam but I remember the wind just, just hit me because I went way too hard at the start so yeah. I slowly started to go backwards 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 and I think I finished second last and um, the guy that the guy that finished last the Belgian guy I'd known him pretty well and he just kind of gave me a high five with him he was like not our day today and I was like 
Yeah. So I remember going back to the warm up track and just being so upset that I was like, I did not do myself justice there. I basically embarrassed myself. Yeah. My my family proud, my club proud, my 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 family proud, all that sort of stuff. So um, it was it was a bitter pill to swallow, to be honest, Killian. But uh, I think those things give build character and make you stronger eventually. So I uh, I learned a lot from from that bad day at the office. Yeah, hundred percent. Then uh, here's a bit of an interesting question because I hear this on a few podcasts, and some people tend to have different answers. But for you personally, do you think the bad days is what make you a better athlete, or the good days? Because I I know like obviously the bad days you learn from your mistakes and and you can adjust things where needs be. But also the good days can make you also realize and give you a bit more confidence. Like all right, maybe I can be better than what I think I can. So for you personally, what did you think? It made you a better athlete. It's a, good, it's a really good question, and I think in sport there is probably in our sport there's definitely more bad days than good. Oh yeah, hundred percent. Always. Yeah. So, and probably in all sports, like there's everyone thinks it's a straight line to the top, and there's going to be lots of success along the way, but it's more of a bumpy road, unfortunately. So it's 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 how you bounce back and how you you. I suppose motivate yourself and stay motivated to to want it more, like to want to get to where you want to be, and that's. I think you definitely learn more from your bad days, and you have to because yeah. if you run bad and you don't take any lessons from it, you'll never improve. Um, like if you if you run tactically bad in a in a cross country race, like yourself, and you're like, feck it, like I shouldn't have went with that group or I, I went way too I surged way too quickly in the middle of the race and it cost me and I didn't bridge the gap or whatever it is like if you don't look back and review and reflect on those things I think that's the only way that people can improve yeah and and in all aspects of life I think but well, definitely obviously race and you can you can pinpoint usually exactly where things went wrong um within a race if it's a distance race or a sprint race or whatever you can usually kind of see and that's where your coach kind of comes into it as well and having a really good support network and people around you that you're able to talk to. Um, I think that's how you will stay going because, yeah, athletics is an individual sport, but it's all about who's around you, your club, your teammates, your, your training partners, your family, your friends. Like they have, to, they have to understand what you're trying to do and trying to achieve as well. Yeah. Um, so that's, I think... You'll definitely learn more from your bad days, and it seems like a cliche. Like that's always. Um, yeah. but I think, I think it is true. Like I can probably probably taking taking more of myself from those days than I have from the good days. Yeah, definitely, and you, you you hit the nail on the head there. Like if you don't, you know, pinpoint things where you went wrong, uh, maybe then you're not as engaged in it, in the sport as you need to be to you know to be winning races so yeah no mm-hmm. i personally i'd have to agree you do learn more from sure, the bad sure. days and the good days um and, and you were talking about there you know it being a bumpy road and on the terms of that you winning your first all ireland was definitely a bit of a bumpy <laughs> road uh, to say the least so do you want to give us a, a bit of a breakdown yeah. on, on how you got there in 2019 yeah so oh, yeah I, I, I remember i threw up a, a post about it and uh, after I won nationals in 2019, like I look back on how many fourth, third, seconds that I had. Yeah. So it was four fourths, one no, sorry, three fourths, one third, four second places, and then eventually got nationals. So if that isn't a lesson for for staying at it and and uh, staying with it, I don't know what is because look, that's something I always wanted to do and. I'm, Unfortunately for me, it was around in a time where there was where there was Thomas Barr, who was basically unbeatable. Yeah. Who came fourth in the Olympic final, for God's sake. So um, <laughs> he he had won seven or eight in a row, I think. Um, so he had beaten myself a good couple of times, and uh, we'd always come close a couple of times, and we we knew in training that you know it was always a ding dong battle. But Tom Tom is Tom, and he's he's an animal on the track. So Definitely. it was very hard to beat him. So I could only win my first nationals when he wasn't there. So, um, but. Yeah, look, it was a bumpy road for me, and there was, if if you looked at every training session I did between 2011 and 2019, there's probably thousands of them. So, it's it's it it takes a long time to get to where you want to be, and even yourself, Killian, like you're only you're very very young. So, it's 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 I hate seeing people when they when they fall out of the sport and when they haven't really reached peak, be it because of injury or because of taking taking the road or that they shouldn't have taken or just losing interest in the sport because. 
that's fair enough and everyone everyone has a different path of course but i do think that people need to try and be in it for the long term if at all possible and i think you'll get your just rewards then at the end of it because i definitely did and uh, it was a great day and something I, i'll never forget i'll cherish that medal until the day i die no, hundred percent. And yeah, when you were mentioning there, you know how many fourth, seconds, and thirds you got. I'd say, even though coming second is better than coming fourth, I say that coming second four times probably deep down in the back of your head felt worse than yeah. coming fourth because you were so so close. Yeah, and that the, the year of I qualified for your World Universities, it, like there's a couple of pictures online and. I remember just like even the video watching back on RT, I think it was, it was on live. The amount of messages and texts, like we, we ran each other really close. Like it was the closest I'd ever tried to, to win it when Tom was in it. Yeah. I ran 50.2. It was, I think that's my second second fastest time ever. And he ran 49.9 or 49 flat, 49.99 or something like that anyway. So it was really close. But um, it, it's, yeah, look, it's, 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 it's there's, there's, Probably other stories out there very similar to just staying with it and and, and staying at it. But I, I definitely had to, to wait a while to win my first national senior title, and um, it it was definitely worth it. All all the years of hard lactic sessions and cold miserable nights on the track, and you'd question yourself why you're doing. And I know we're just talking about the bad days, but for those one or two good days of of euphoria, yeah, it's it's definitely worth it, Kelly. No, hundred percent. And what uh, what was the feeling like when you became All Ireland champion? Because you know, some people you were even saying there, you know, Tom came fourth in the Olympics, which is obviously a, a great achievement. But becoming the best in the country for a year, or if you re if you regain your title, but what was that feeling like? I'd say it was better than any other, you know, yeah. Irish vest, you know. Yeah, no, it was like just I remember it was really close race as well. Um, so it was kind of wasn't one of my fastest times that year, but then Tom decided not to run it. So I knew that that was my chance, and that probably that probably piled the pressure on it even more. Yeah. So as if 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 Tom or someone else was in the race, you're just like, oh well, maybe they're just going to win it again. Um, and you have to kind of believe that you're, you're you have a chance to win it. Of course, you have a chance. It's the hurdles. Anything can happen. Definitely. Like fall and, and all that sort of stuff. So, um, but Tom pulled out. Um, he was. I think he was kind of had a little bit of a little niggle and he was coming up towards the world champs in 2019. So he decided not to run. But uh, another another great sparring partner I've, I've raced a lot is Jason Harvey, who would, we've we've raced each other hundreds of times, I'd say, at this stage, and we've always been ding-dong battles. He's been second, I've been third at nationals a lot of times as well. So it was both of our chance to win it. And um, right to the line, he, he dove over the line. There's a picture of it on, on my social media. And I'm just shouting and roaring and screaming as soon as I crossed the line because uh, it, was, it was a really good feeling. And the fact that it was such a close race and a really good race between the two of us, I think, made it even better. So the crowd were, were loving it, I think. No, definitely. I've actually, I actually seen that picture just today. It was a, yeah. it was a great picture. But you were saying there that, like, yeah, maybe Tom Barr wasn't in the race, which might have given you that little bit of an advantage. But realistically, at the end of the day, you can only race who's in front of you. That's so it, if you were turning up to the race and nobody was there and you won, like there's nothing you can do, or you can only race who's in front of you. So I'd still take it. I'd still take it. Exactly. In all like, Ireland winning medals and all Ireland winning medal. That's it. They, they, they don't come along all that often. So no. if, if you get one, if you get one, it's definitely worth it. It's definitely, definitely. worth it. So uh, no, it's it's a great memory and. I'll uh, I'll cher cherish that one for sure. Not a hundred percent, yeah, and, and you've every right to, you know. It's um, you know, there's not there's not many stories in you know All Ireland champions like yours, and I know there's a few, but just to the extent that you had to go and the amount of races that you had to race is uh, it's quite extraordinary. So yeah, definitely that would be uh, that race will have a place in your heart for probably the rest of your life. Yeah, hopefully. Well, look, I, I, I'm. I'm... I'm training a little bit, but not as much as I would like because of because of work and I've taken on the role in DCU. So it's uh, it's hopefully maybe someday I would I would get back and train and try and compete at nationals. But at the moment I'm too, a little bit too busy to be able to, to do that. So uh, we'll, we'll, we'll we'll hold on to the one I have at the moment and maybe see if I can get back in the next couple of years. Yeah, definitely, and I'd say you're not uh, you're not short short of a bit of work, especially being uh, head of athletics and DCU. So, kind of, how did that come about? You know, it's not it's not the job you hear uh, every day. So, just a bit of insight on how you actually got into that. So, yeah, I was living in Limerick um, for la from 2014 to 2019. So it was five years in Limerick, uh, training down there, 
um, working down there at the time for Athletics Ireland, like I said, so I was a development officer. Um, so I was going around to clubs and helping clubs out and putting on coaching workshops and coach, and educa- coach education stuff. So I really enjoyed that. And it was something I had done for almost two years then. And the job came up in DCU and I just applied for it, not really, not really expecting much because I, was, I hadn't um, that much experience built up. But uh, I interviewed and, and uh, found myself that I'd, I'd got it and I was delighted. So it was a big change for me to move back up to Dublin and... Um, uh, get back up here and like I went to DCU so it felt like everything had went full circle and um, I didn't yeah. expect that I would be in that role and I feel very lucky and very privileged to be in that role because it's it's pretty much a dream job for me because um, I'm dealing with athletes every day um, really high level athletes some of them and trying to trying to help athletes in Ireland transition to the next level in their career be it ad- athletically and uh, academically so DCU is a really good college. She has lots of different courses from sports courses, sports science, PE to, to business, computers, um, languages. We, we've taken St. Pat's campus now down in Drumcondra and All, All Hallows campus here um, in, in, in Drumcondra as well. So it's, it's, it's starting to expand and, and get bigger. But the job itself, yeah, is, is, is I'm, I'm dealing with athletes day to day, running the club in DCU, making sure there's a really strong athletics group and club and, and, and scholarship level athletes in DCU and like obviously there's, there's a really strong history of athletes going over to America especially in the distance events and we really want to and have been um, giving people an option in Ireland to stay at home and be coached here and, and develop the, develop their careers here and, and um, I'm, I'm really passionate and very lucky to, to be in the job really hit in. Yeah definitely it sounds like a really really great job but we're in the job you know um what what would you really be dealing with from a day to day basis? Would it be coaching, dealing with scholarships, organising races. What would be a, a typical day for you? So it's it's been the most stop start year ever because I started in last November. So yeah. the semester was was kind of halfway through by the time I started, and then Christmas came, so we had a bit of a break, and then we were flying it back in. Jet- we had, we had the road relays which are on in November every year. So DCU, the guys won that. I think the girls were second so we had a good good competition that that and then i was we came back after the the christmas break and we were getting along nicely and we were heading towards indoors so varsity indoors run in february in athlone and we won we have some really good really good performances from the athletes there like there was a couple of varsity records and there was a load of medals coming back to dcu and we won i think overall titles there as well and then just right before our very, very, very last event before everything went into lockdown was Varsity Cross Country, yeah, running, which is on in Cork, and I think on the 9th of March, and then the following week, everything went into lockdown. So uh, a club mate of yours, Cahill Doyle, actually ended up winning that. And he didn't do it. The DCU vest, and it was a, a really, really strong run. So we had Doyler, we had Andrew Costgrim was second, and... Um, a really good really strong men's team and the women's team came second and Claire Fagan I think won that so like even mentioning those athletes names like we have some really really strong athletes and they're 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 building their really strong athletic and academic careers here in in Ireland which is great to see and I'm delighted to be able to help those um but yeah to 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 go back to your question what's what's the day today like it's on, no, on a normal year, it would be you know planning for those sort of events like road relays, cross country, um, indoors, outdoors. Um, at the moment, it's kind of keeping 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 everyone uh, keeping the show on the road and trying to meet as many athletes, be it on Zoom or face to face and in campus as much as much as they can, and making sure that they have everything they need and everything's going okay academically because there isn't really any competitions at the moment. And I think athletes are kind of suffering a little bit in in that regard. There's there's no real end goal at the moment, and but I see today that there was cross country fixtures announced from from Athletics Ireland, which is which is great news. Yeah. I think everyone, everyone needed that just as a, a sigh of relief to, to have something to aim towards. And even if it doesn't go ahead, if we're back in lockdown, I think it's still good mentally to be like, right, we've we've something to look forward to now. Something. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, look, it's 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 every day is different in the job. To be honest with you, Killian, I'm meeting athletes, I'm meeting coaches, we're planning training, we're we're, we're, we're looking at getting new gear, we're, we're 
trying to organize all the scholarships where I'm linking in with some of my colleagues who work in the sports department where we're doing everything and um, it's a great job but it's 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 busy all the time but that's good yeah no it is good to be busy and I'd say you know uh, most days any day, uh, anyway you'd be waking up in the morning not really dreading going in because no. from from the outside looking in it seems like a pretty good job and especially yeah. someone like you who has a huge interest and a huge knowledge about athletics it, it, it must be it must be pretty exciting to say it's my dream job, I think it's 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 not far off because um, I didn't think when I was in DCU that if you asked me when I was there, I'd be be the head of athletics. That which I would have had to I would have had to rub my eyes, and make sure that I wasn't dreaming. Like yeah. because it's it's every day. It's some days you have good days and bad days, of course, and it's, it's uh-huh. yeah. it can be difficult. But it's like any job, it's it has its its rewards, and what I get the most buzz out of is just seeing athletes run PBs and transition through and. You know, in, in the three or four years that they're in college in DCU, that they they get to where they want to be, and they make the next step in their career, um, and they leave us a better athlete and a better person. And I'm only a year there, so it's it's kind of it's going to be a few years before I really see the athletes that I'm working with now like really transition through. But I would hope that you know, in, in ten years' time, when they when they're long gone from DCU, that they look back at that time when they're with when they're with us and go look. DCU and Paul Byrne really, really made a, a positive impact on my athletics career. I really enjoyed my time in DCU, and that's kind of what I, what I really want to get out of the job most. And have really good performances, of course, along the way. Like we've, we've, we've athletes like Andrew Cosgrim, like Nadia Power, like Cahill Doyle, Brian Fay, uh, Michaela Walsh. Uh, the list goes on. So it's, it's a great place to work, and a, and a great team of athletes there at the moment. Yeah, definitely. You said like you you only started there at the end of what was the end of last year, just before before Christmas, uh, coming up to Christmas. So like you haven't really experienced much of, and especially with it, new people coming in, you haven't experienced you know people coming from sixth year into into DCU starting up the legs the first time and then getting to see them grow as as an athlete as well. So I'd say you're pretty excited to see it all. Yeah, like it's. I feel sorry for the for the for the guys that have just come in from their leaving cert because they have had no no nothing to really look forward to at all. Yeah. And it was all over the place. So it's been trying to like day to day at the moment. It's trying to meet as many of them as we can, and making sure that they're doing okay and, and, and in that way. Because a lot of them are living at home now instead of living in the athlete accommodation which we have in DCU and stuff. So we don't get to see as many of them as I would like face to face. But it's just on Zoom for the moment, unfortunately. Yeah. But, in, in the next few weeks and months, uh, we'll be able to get back to really strong training as a group and um, push on hopefully from there and hopefully have some really good competitions to, to look forward to and get really strong teams out. So we're hosting the, the varsity cross country in March, hopefully, and in DCU over in, in St. Clair's. So um, I'm looking forward to that one and we'll get some really strong men's and women's teams out and bring the titles back, hopefully. Fingers crossed, and yeah, hopefully, hopefully that all goes ahead with, with no problem at all. And hopefully, in what two years, three years, I'll I'll be seeing you for the athletics team in DCU. Absolutely, Killian, you're more than welcome. We've 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 had a, a lot of clan lift athletes through the door, so um, we'll, we'll we'll keep that going strong if we can. Perfect. Yeah, fingers crossed. Anyway, but um, now Paul, I really appreciate you coming on to the podcast. About fifty-five minutes long, and uh, oh. I usually say when these conversations they seem like about ten minutes. So that oh, was, crazy. yeah, it was a really, really great episode, and I appreciate you coming on. I hope you enjoyed. Not at all, Killian. Keep up the great work, man. Really enjoying listening to the podcast, and hopefully see you around Century soon. Fingers crossed, and uh, thanks to everyone watching and listening at home once again, Paul. Thanks for coming on, and I'll see you all next time. Bye. Yeah, bye.